The creed declares, almost in matter-of-fact manner, the third day he rose again from the dead. The creed talks about Jesus being raised, not so much rising, but being raised. And what's trying to bring across there is that this was something that was done to Jesus. It is a divine action. Jesus was raised up by God, something that God did in order to demonstrate his vindication of his son, and that this really was none other than the Son of God. It isn't some esoteric doctrine, it's actually about what happened. The fact that uh, yeah, that Jesus was crucified, almost everybody accepts uh, that he died, but that he rose again. And that, of course, is at the very heart of the Christian faith. Paul said, I delivered as of first importance that Christ died for our sins, that on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. So that is fundamental to the Christian faith. We are to look on the crucifixion and the resurrection as a single event. We should not separate or contrast them. We shouldn't think of the crucifixion as somehow a failure that is put right by the resurrection. They form an undivided action. The resurrection is, is the cornerstone of New Testament Christianity. The early Christians went around preaching that. It was sure, it was certain, it was hope-filled. And Paul says that if it didn't happen, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then, you know, frankly, our whole faith is in vain and we're wasting our time. We would be left very uncertain and unsure uh, about the meaning of our faith. Was the sacrifice accepted uh, or do we still have to offer it? Were, was sin forgiven or, or are we still hoping that God might one day forgive our sin? without any sense of assurance. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ affirms that death has been conquered, our worst enemy, that the wages of sin has been paid in full. The resurrection has to be understood in terms of the defeat of death. The victory of Christ over sin and death is already accomplished on the cross, but it is still a hidden victory. Only with the eye of faith do we see the victory. Looking at it without faith, we just see a dead man hanging on the cross. To the human eye, death still looks like it has the ultimate answer, the ultimate stage, the ultimate say. And the people didn't expect him to be risen from the dead. It wasn't as though the apostles were standing outside the tomb waiting for Easter morning. They were away quite convinced the whole thing was over. Here you have a bunch of men who are disappointed, disillusioned, their hopes are dashed. Their master has died on a cross, he's executed. 
on what basis do you found a new religion? It was over. It was finished. Instead, the Christian religion began and spread across the world because Jesus rose from the tomb. If we have the eye of faith, then we say, he who has died is God, and God is life. So, though the life dies, and that is the paradox of the cross. Death, which is unnatural because it has entered our world because we sinned, is a power and a force. It is that which haunts us. It is not something that just happens. It's a force, a power, a principality. That's death. The power of God, which is already present on the cross, shows itself openly when God rises from the dead on the third day. The resurrection of Jesus Christ affirms that death has been conquered, our worst enemy, that the wages of sin has been paid in full. The resurrection is simply the making manifest of the victory already won upon the cross. The resurrection is really the place where faith is born. Because you have faith in the resurrection, you have faith in the fact that Christ ascended into heaven and thereby defeated the power of death. Life is stronger than death. Love is stronger than hatred. Light is stronger than darkness. And so Christ's cross is not in fact a defeat, but it is a victory. A hidden victory. The oppressing opposition that we face in life, whether it be from sin or Satan or suffering, has been dealt with by the cross of Christ and overcome, and he has triumphed and conquered, and new life is now available. The resurrection was seen as something completely new. Now, that means, therefore, we can't really explain it very well. Uh, what it isn't is a resuscitation of the corpuscles of his body. The resurrection was not about the resuscitation of a person who had fainted. There are numbers of biblical stories of someone who was dead or believed to be dead and they come back to life and you never hear any more about them. Lazarus died and he came back to life but that is not the same as the resurrection of Jesus because Lazarus died again later. I always felt sorry for Lazarus. He has to die twice. Jesus was not resuscitated. He was dead. He was buried, but he was resurrected. And that's one of the mysteries at the heart of the resurrection. It really happened, but it wasn't a resuscitation. It was a transformation into a new sort of physicality. Some people have said, well, you know, maybe he was raised just sort of in a spiritual phantom. But no, what was raised was what was buried. Paul underlines that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where he summarizes the gospel that he died and he was buried. He didn't swoon, he didn't faint, he died. He was buried, his body grew cold in the tomb. He was really dead. Unless he really died, the resurrection wasn't truly the resurrection. So Jesus was thoroughly dead, he was thoroughly buried, and then, as I and others have argued at length in books and so on, on the third day he really was found to be alive again, leaving an empty tomb behind him, but with, as it were, a transformed body. Paul tries to find a word for it, and he says it is sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. On one hand, when he appears to the disciples, he says, you can touch me. Other times he seems to go through the door or whatever, uh, you, you put them all together, you're not going to get a clear picture except that they all agree that this is unprecedented and that this is where faith is born. As they reflected on what had happened at Easter, they began to say things like Paul does, that Christ will never die again. Death has no more dominion over him. He's died once and now he's alive for always. And that's a way of saying that the body he now has is not susceptible to pain, to sickness, or to death itself. It's a real body, but unlike his first body, and Paul describes the resurrection body as the heavenly body, but as a real body in 1 Corinthians 15. So Jesus' body has ceased to be a corruptible body like ours now, and has become an incorruptible, a non-harmable body, a non-dying body. 
And so Paul and the others, greatly daring, explore what it means that we will one day have a body like that, which will be in a sense the same, recognizably in us, but in a sense different. And therefore the resurrection is not simply saying something important about Jesus, but something important about our destiny as well. It's the anticipation, the first fruits, the beginning of the resurrection of the dead at the end when we all rise uh, to face him. The resurrection is something which you and I as believers will share in. Where Christ has gone in glory, we one day will go as well. If you read the New Testament in the original Greek, you just sense here's a document that is just, something is happening, there's life throbbing. And, and the basis of that new life is Christ is risen, Christ is risen. Death has been conquered. Our sins have been forgiven. He's alive. Lives again our glorious King. Alleluia. Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting. Alleluia. Thee we greet triumphant now. According to the Creed, after his resurrection, Jesus ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. We come to one of the very strange bits of the story, which is what we call the Ascension. The Ascension of Jesus is not much mentioned in the New Testament. It's affirmed in the book of Acts. Then you don't find it elaborated. Nevertheless, the Creed singled it out. It's sort of the, the continuation of the argument for the resurrection. This one who left the tomb empty, where is he? Jesus rose from the dead. He, he, he was with the disciples. He, he met up with them from time to time. He ate with them and so on, taught them. But that only happened for 40 days. 40 days after the resurrection, he ascends into heaven. But heaven is not a place. Heaven is a level of reality. It's not a point in geographical space. We in the modern West have tended to think of heaven as a location somewhere up above within our 
cosmos within our world, as though if you went up far enough in a spacecraft, you might get there eventually. Uh, famously, Yuri Gagarin, the Soviet cosmonaut, said that he disproved God because he'd been around the world in his spaceship a few times and he hadn't seen God anywhere out there. And as one or two people said, it would have been really rather worrying if he had, actually. And that's, of course, not how the language of heaven and earth work in the Bible. The creed is using picture language, which is what we have to do when we are speaking of things that lie beyond our present experience beyond our present comprehension. In the Bible, the language of heaven and earth work in a very different way, that heaven and earth are the two interlocking, overlapping spheres of God's reality. God made heaven and earth not upstairs, downstairs, but like a different dimension of present reality. And the point of the ascension is that Jesus, still as a human being, still as an embodied human being, has gone into God's space, God's dimension of reality. And the point about that is that one day the two spheres of reality, the two dimensions, will come back together again. The veil between them will be removed and heaven and earth will be one, which is why the early Christians, when they speak about the ascension, also speak about the second coming or the reappearing of Jesus, as Paul puts it in Colossians 3. Uh, when he appears, says John in 1 John, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. So the early Christians had to get their minds around all sorts of things that they'd certainly not been expecting. His death, his resurrection, what are we going to say about the time in between? And then this sense that Jesus is now in God's dimension, which means he is both very close to us because heaven is always very near to where we are, but at the same time absent from us because there is still this veil between heaven and earth. And in talking about this language of ascension, the creed is saying that wherever God is, Christ has gone to be with him. God becomes human in Jesus, manifests God's cruciform love in the cross. That cruciform love plumbs the depths of human rebellion in hell. And comes back full circle to God. But, and this is the vital point, he does not return in the same state in which he was before the incarnation. He returns to heaven, to his place with the Father, in his human body. He is there in heaven at the right hand of the Father as a human being. And he's there uh, as still wounded yet risen humanity he still bears the scars of our suffering what a wonderful thing that there is a man in heaven he's not an ex-man he is a true man so the incarnation if you like is unending the ascension doesn't mean that he somehow lays aside his manhood it means that he takes his human nature our nature into heaven. Paul says, so that we also are seated with him in the heavenly places. I mean, there's a wonderful statement there in, in Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul sort of gives the whole history. He says, once you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the people of disobedience. But God, who is rich in mercy, while we were yet dead, made us alive together with Christ, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that's a past tense verb that Paul uses. Paul's not talking about something that's going to happen in the future. You see, Paul is saying that when we respond to this cruciform love of God in Christ, the love that plumbs the depths of our deadness, why were we yet dead, you see? That if we respond to that love, then God raises us out of that deadness to life in Christ and begins that process of restoring us to loving union with him. We are seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are with him as he sits at God's right hand, in a sense. The idea is exaltation. And that is exactly what the uh, session at the right hand of God is telling us. The right hand is the place of favor. It's the place of honor. Again, he's seated. That's, that's significant because in the letter to the Hebrews, it makes a lot about the fact that Christ suffered once for all. 
It's a one-off suffering. It only happened once. Uh, the crucifixion happened once. The sacrifice was made once, only offered once. It's all done. His sacrifice, if you like, is accepted. It is approved. He is the conqueror. He sits down on the throne. He has done the job. Our salvation is accomplished. Calvary was the great victory day. It was the the day that ensures the ultimate end of this great warfare between good and evil. So he sits at the right hand of God. He is there at the right hand of God, not to be taken literally as though there was two chairs up there and, and Jesus sitting in one and the Father in another one. Obviously it's figurative language because every other testimony is that God has known fills the universe and is invisible. That's the first line of a lot of hymns. And if invisible, they don't need a chair and a throne. So this is pictorial language, it's visionary language. As I say, it's the language of stained glass windows. One of the most important biblical passages that Jesus and the early Christians referred to is the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter seven, there is an extraordinary scene, a great dream of these monsters who come up out of the sea to attack God's people and they are interpreted in terms of uh, four empires that come up to attack Israel, the people of God. And then the scene develops and it says the Ancient of Days, or one who was Ancient of Days, took his seat with thousands of angels around him and so on. And then one like a son of man came on the clouds and was presented to the Ancient of Days and was made to sit at his right hand. Now. This scene in the book of Daniel is then put together with a verse from Psalm 110 in which uh, the psalmist says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And when we read the gospels, it looks as though Jesus himself combined those two texts in such a way as to say that when the representative of God's people, the son of man, is exalted after his suffering, then he will be seen to be the Messiah, the one who sits at God's right hand. And the point about that imagery of sitting at God's right hand is, it, is that that is the one who does the will of the one who sits on the throne. We talk to this day about so-and-so as my right-hand man. Yeah, he's the one who actually gets on and does the things that I have thought about doing. And so there's, there's a lot of that. So it's a messianic image and it's a son of man image and it's a way of calling up those biblical passages and investing the events to do with Jesus with the theological significance from those two passages. To sit at the right hand of the throne of God is to sit at the place of maximum influence, uh, uh, to be the most confident advisor, to, to be the, the closest to the King of Kings, God himself. Seated at the right hand of the Father means that without ceasing to be human, he now returns to the full exercise of his Godhead. He has equal power and he can carry out all of the things that is the will of the Father because his will and the Father's will are one. So it's saying that Jesus Christ resumes his place at the very control center of our universe. The throne is the place of power. The throne is the place of direction. That's where God's plan is being worked out and God uh, takes Jesus back by way of affirmation into that uh, unique and very close and intimate uh, relationship again uh, for his plan to go on unfolding. There are distinctive functions that uh, Jesus is doing um, just as the Holy Spirit has distinctive functions. One of the wonderful things that um, the New Testament says of him is that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, that he's there next to God, bearing our problems, bearing our sins, interceding on our behalf. When we talk about Jesus interceding for us, it reminds us that we are sinners who actually have no right to expect anything from God, that we have really no basis for any claim for divine favor, for divine love or anything like that. But Jesus, as our representative, is able to plead our cause before God. God sees us as we are in Him. 
Jesus brings us before God. He pleads our cause before God. And because he is our righteous and risen Savior, we know that even though we are weak and fallen and sinful, Christ nevertheless is bringing us before God and bringing us before God in a way that we know he will hear his pleading on our behalf. He is the instrument of care. He is seen as the good shepherd and the healer. Christians talk about Jesus being the mediator between God and humanity. He is the mediator who introduces us, the agent that gives us an opening that we wouldn't otherwise have uh, right into God's presence. And by that they mean that Jesus brings God to us. He shows us what God is like. He makes it possible by his resurrection to relate to God, but also that he mediates us to God. In effect, he pleads our cause before God. And that's one of the reasons why Christians may have confidence that they can know that their Savior and their Lord is pleading their cause with God at this moment. He's there not inactively waiting around until God says, OK, it's time to go back to earth again and complete the work you began uh, in what's sometimes called the second coming, the return of Jesus Christ. I go to prepare a place for you, he says in the Last Supper discourse in John's Gospel. And this is exactly what he does. He takes our humanness into the divine glory. And that means there is a place for you and me in heaven prepared. He has gone as our forerunner, as the first fruits. And he has opened the way for us to follow. The King, when our Lord shall come, Hallelujah. Longing, gasping after home, Alleluia. In the last clause of the second paragraph about Jesus Christ, it says that he will come from heaven to judge the living and the dead, the second coming. Jesus' exaltation into heaven at the right hand of God the Father is not the end of the story. There's another act uh, still to follow. There's the first coming of Christ, but that's only half the picture. The Christian understanding from the earliest days was that Christ would return at the end, at the consummation of history. A very high proportion of the chapters of the New Testament contain some other reference to the return of Christ. Jesus himself said, I will come again. I'm going away, but I will come back. So Christians lived every day in the light of the promise of Jesus' return in glory. And it's reflected in every aspect of Christian life. It's there in baptism, which witnesses to the resurrection itself that we shall experience at Christ's return. It's there in the Lord's Supper. St. Paul says, as often as we share the cup and the bread, we show forth the Lord's death until He comes again. It's there in our prayers, in the scriptures, in every aspect of Christian life. The belief, the hope of Jesus coming again in glory. The very last word of the New Testament is, Behold, I'm coming quickly. And then the affirmation comes, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Because although here we have some of the benefits of what he came to do, we, we can be put right with God and so on, and he's given us his Holy Spirit. But we're only too aware that what we have here and now is imperfect, that, uh, that we're, we're far from perfect in our lives, that this world is far from perfect and so on. And therefore, it needs for him to return again to put everything right. We eagerly long for that which has not yet happened in its fullness. This is also one reason which why Jews today, as perhaps in other generations, have a problem with the idea that Jesus is the Messiah. The Jews in Jesus' day were looking for the restoration of the kingdom. 
And that was that was a lot. That was an event that was going to take place on a linear line of history. They 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 divided the the the, the history into two ages: this age and the age to come. The age to come was the age of the restored kingdom. That's when God would restore the kingdom to Israel. They meant the physical geography of Palestine. The, the Gentiles would become their servants. In Jesus' day, Rome would be overthrown. Uh, Jerusalem would become the capital of the world. God's presence would be restored to the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, the righteous dead would be resurrected to participate in this restored kingdom. These are all dynamics of, the, of restoring the kingdom to Israel. And this is what they're looking for. This is what they are hungering for in Jesus' day. And even in, in Acts 1-6, the disciples, meeting with the resurrected Lord, say to him, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? See, that, that's their thinking. That's their understanding. And along this line, you see, there's going to come a moment where God is going to intervene. And messianic expectations revolved around that moment. There were various messianic expectations, but they all revolved around that moment when God would bring this age to a close and inaugurate the age to come or restore the kingdom to Israel. It would be a historical event in human history and things would go on from that the way they have been, except now the kingdom is restored. So that's their understanding. A Jew will often say, you, you say, well, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they'll say, don't be daft. When the Messiah comes, the Messiah will bring peace. He'll bring pre peace. There will be justice. Jesus comes and he starts talking about the kingdom already present with Rome still in the driver's seat, with nothing changed. Look in the world today. Do we see peace? Do we see justice? Uh, obviously we don't. What's going on here, you see? And Jesus talks about in his parable of the wheat and the weeds. And the wheat are the sons and daughters of the kingdom. The weeds are sown by the evil one. And Jesus says they grow together until the harvest, until the end. Jesus gives an image not of this age, age to come, but of that age to come of the kingdom breaking in. In his life, in ministry, the kingdom has come. The, the Pharisees ask him on one occasion, when's the kingdom come? Where are the signs? And Jesus said, it's already in your midst. It was already here. And so Jesus changes the picture. You may take that Jewish straight line, and Jesus does this with it. He overlaps it. And the kingdom is inaugurated in his life and ministry, in the incarnation. And now, the kingdom life you see, the citizens of the kingdom live right in the midst of the citizens of this age. Or in John's vision, the citizens of New Jerusalem live in the midst of a fallen Babylon world. We know that here and now we live in a, a time where good and evil are struggling against each other, where sometimes the bad guys seem to win for a while and so on. Uh, but the return of Christ means that's only temporary. There's going to be a, an ultimate consummation. The kingdom is now, but not yet. It's not fully consummated. And so in that sense, the Jews are right. The Jews are awaiting the Messiah, and so are we. The Messiah is yet to come. You see, we have the first fruits, Paul says. So there's going to be a consummation of the kingdom, and there's also going to be the consummation of this age, that it will come to an end. And it's that, it's around that event that the second coming is located. We believe that the one who is coming, the Messiah we're both waiting for, is Jesus, who already has come and who died for us and rose again when he came the first time. It is surely significant that in the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, we have the words of the risen Christ, surely I am coming quickly. If we think about that last word, our minds can flip right back to the very first word of Scripture, the Old Testament, Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created. Christianity is not a religion that is based upon a cyclical view of history, a perpetual repeating and returning again and again and again to that which we have experienced before. No, history has a beginning point, creation. So the doctrine of creation is very important. The universe had a beginning, it didn't just happen. The last word of scripture says, the universe is going somewhere. History is not blind chance, random. It's moving to end, to climax, to fulfillment. God is going to bring it all together in His time, in His way. He will deal with evil, and He will deal with evil in us, and there will be the age to come where there will be righteousness and peace. It's not something that is just hope, something wishy-washy. It means that God will act. He's the God who has always acted. He created, 
He acted in history. Jesus came the first time. Jesus will come the second time and bring it all together, wrap it all up. Exactly how it will be take place, we do not know. But we believe simultaneously throughout the world, the return of the Lord will be apparent. It's not something to be spiritualized away. We mean not merely a spiritual coming, we mean actually an event in history. And this is what the second coming is about. The early Christians expected the second coming of Christ to occur very soon in their own lifetime. From one point of view, they were wrong because 2,000 years have passed the second coming has not yet occurred. But from another point of view, they were not wrong. Even if the second coming of Christ is delayed in clock and calendar time, yet from a spiritual point of view, it is always near at hand. Does it mean that we should get up every morning and think, is it going to be today that we should spend hours and hours trying to work out when it will happen? Uh, well, no, it doesn't. In Scripture, we are told that the second coming will be as a thief in the night. That is St. Paul's phrase. We're also given certain signs to watch for. I don't think these signs give us the possibility to calculate and predict exactly when the second coming will be. The message of the Bible is that we should always be watchful, always be vigilant and expectant even if it were true, and of course no one knows, but even if it were true that Christ is coming tomorrow, he would expect me not to be waiting on the tarmac for him, but to be faithfully about my regular duties. The primary focus is what it means to be a follower of the Lamb now, here, today, and in every age of human history. Luther made a, a very interesting comment. He said, if Christ is going to return tomorrow, today I will plant a tree. <laughs> in other words, what he was saying is that my responsibility here and now is to get on with life and the duties God has given me, which is not sitting down trying to calculate the hour of his return when Jesus said he himself didn't know that, but to get on and be faithful and to live here and now. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Oh, come quickly, oh, come quickly, everlasting God, come down. judgment has set, the books have been opened, how shall we stand in that great day, when every thought and word and action, God the righteous judge shall weigh, shall we be The creed moves on to the phrase, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. We think of judgment as God sitting on God's throne, pronouncing judgment. You're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. When we think about judgment, it's usually a negative word for us. This idea of judgment is something that really seems to be a disconnect from modern people. If I say so-and-so is going to be judged today, uh, I tremble because I think, you know, something bad is going to happen. Who wants to go to court? It's a world of litigation. We, who, who wants to be there and uh, have lawyers arguing? And uh, for many people, the very idea of going to court, uh, they can't sleep the night before or weeks before. We are terrified of judgment, most of us. So is this a downer in the creed? Not really. If we go back again to Scripture, and I think we always must to understand the creed because it's based on Scripture, we find that the idea of judgment is a positive idea. Throughout the Old Testament, God's people are crying out to God, Oh God, when are you going to judge? Meaning, when are you going to stand up for us? If you go to the Psalms, the Psalms between roughly 95 and 100 particularly, uh, you find that the trees of the field 
uh, are going to clap their hands because God is coming to judge the world. Now, what do they mean by that? They mean God is coming to put the world to rights, to sort everything out. In the ancient Hebrew world, if society was in a mess, the judge would come and take his seat and sort it out and say who was in the right and who was in the wrong and restore the community to healthy, wholesome, functional life instead of messy, dysfunctional life. And so everyone would, phew, that's all right. We're put back straight again. Now that's the sense of judgment which comes through into the New Testament as well. We have taken it as, you know, God is going to be cross with us, but it's really not like that. It's if somebody is going to come and clean up the mess. The question at that point is, are you part of the mess or are you part of the solution, if you like? Well, of Daniel is a great judgment scene, and judgment is given on behalf of God's people, over against the oppressors of God's people. The judgment is the time when God sets things right. The righteous, many of whom will have suffered in this world up to now, will be vindicated. The believers will enter fully into the promise, and the wicked, even if they prospered in this world, will finally uh, be judged and condemned. And anyone who is a believer in the power of goodness should be very thankful that there is a judgment. Because without that, life would be such a mockery. When we look at the things that are going on in this world, there are many of them that are so evil. There's no retribution in the sense of some kind of angry, vindictive God, you know, taking out a whip and lashing you to pieces. This isn't about God being harsh or vindictive. You know, when you're in harmony with gravity, you're, you're healthy, you're whole, you're comfortable. And when you step off the edge of a roof, does, does gravity suddenly become wrathful? No, it just keeps on being gravity. When you splat at the bottom of your fall, it sure feels like wrath. <laughs> but gravity's not wrathful. When you step off the edge of the spiritual roof of your relationship with God, does God suddenly become wrathful? No, God keeps on being the holy God. And as you move farther and farther away in your unholiness, you experience the torment of that unholiness, which feels like wrath. And of course, since God is the, is the creator of this entire structure, see, we blame it on God. Well, this is God's wrath. Those in hell, if you like, are not punished by God. They punish themselves. Of course, what the cross reveals to us is that God grieves over that, that God experiences that torment in God's own being, but never coerces us into restoration, because a coerced restoration is not a loving union. So we're always free to say no, and in that saying no, in that turning of our back on God, in stepping off the edge of that spiritual reality, we experience in our lives the brokenness, the disintegration, the torment, the pain that is the consequence of not being in loving union with God. Christ's judgment is his love, and the standard by which he will judge us is, did we show love? That judgment is not something that is some kind of punitive retribution, but rather it is simply the revelation of our bentness in the presence of that which is perfectly straight. It is the revelation of our brokenness in the presence of that which is perfectly whole. So there will be a final spelling out of the meaning of the lives of all of us before Christ in his presence at the second coming. All of us will be seen in the light of Christ-likeness for which we were created. We were created to be like Jesus. We were created for Christ-likeness. When that perfect Christ-likeness becomes manifest, any unchristlike any unchristlikeness in us also becomes manifest. A useful way of thinking about it is this. When a doctor makes a diagnosis, he is saying, there is something wrong with you. Let's say you have a, a room full of people who are simply lines, okay? And they are sort of wavy. Some of them may be wavier than others, but they're, they're all sort of wavy. But they have identified themselves as straight. And then someone brings a straight edge into that room. 
and suddenly all of their crookedness becomes manifest against the reality of the straight edge. Now, the straight edge judges them, but not in some sort of vindictive, punitive sort of way. See, we always, we always take punishment and vindictiveness and retribution with judgment. But the straight edge judges them simply by its reality as a straight edge, and their bentness becomes manifest in the presence of that reality. It is simply about God being realistic and saying, this needs to be done if you are to have salvation. The question, therefore, is, has this been done? There certainly is consequences of being found unchristlike. We are seen to be sinners. And that is the judgment. The judgment is basically about whether we have done what is necessary in order to be able to be united with God and to be with Him forever. We have lots of questions as ordinary human beings about the justice of God in doing that. Any human judge sitting in a court of law can only make a decision on the basis of the evidence presented, and the evidence presented will often only be partial. You can only make assumptions about people's motives, and motives can be interpreted in different ways humanly. But this God is the God who understands us through and through. The thing about the judgment that is such a comfort is God never gets it wrong. Everybody will agree with the rightness of the judgment when it happens. No one will say, oh, it was unfair on me, or this and that happened. No, it will be acknowledged that God is all and is in all, and that his judgment is perfect, and shall not the judge of, the, of all the world do right, um, as was said back in the Old Testament. As the Anglican prayer says, he's the God to whom all hearts are open and all desires are known. Nothing is secret or hid from him. So he's the God who can actually understand us almost better, in a sense, than we can understand ourselves. He will judge with perfect justice. So a question that might arise at this point is this. We are sinners. God is righteous. How on earth can a sinner hope to evade judgment at the hands of a righteous God? And that's a question that troubled Martin Luther, the great German reformer in the 16th century. He was deeply aware of his own sin and of God's righteousness. So how, he asked, can I ever relate to this God? That's an awesome prospect. We approach that or should approach that with some degree of fear. And he found his answer by reading St. Paul very carefully. And the answer he found was this, that God gives him the righteousness he needs to stand in God's sight as a gift. That something that he could never hope to achieve, never hope to earn, was being given to him by this gracious and righteous God. And so Luther began to realize that God sees us as we are in Christ, that we are enfolded or shielded or protected by the righteousness which Christ won by his obedience on the cross. And so Luther began to realize that he was able to enter into the presence of God, not because of his own righteousness, for he had none, but rather because of Christ's righteousness, which was given to him as a gift by God because of his faith. So for Luther, the answer was faith. Faith unites us to Christ and allows us to share in his righteousness and thus to enter into God's presence with confidence because of who Christ is and what he has done for all of us. We can go into that divine ultimate court of law with a sense of great confidence, knowing that the end result will be that we are not guilty. In our case, the judge is also our lawyer. We've got the best lawyer in the universe. Afraid of the judgment? No way. In this doctrine, there is a great joy and gratitude at the word judgment because the judge is the one who loves you and has redeemed you so that it is a life that's free from the fear of judgment. It's a free from the fear of curse and a fear of damnation. Arise, my soul, arise, shake all
in John chapter 5, verse 24, here's Jesus speaking. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has, not will have, has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has already passed from death to life. That is very significant. Already passed from death to life and we ask ourselves, how could that be? It's because of the cross. We're only saved by the cross. You have to refer always back to the cross. For the Christian who's justified by faith in that death, the judgment has already taken place because the death of Christ and the righteousness of Christ on that cross covers us. We are understood as being a part of Christ. We are, as Luther would say, under the wings of Christ. We are, as Paul says, reckoned righteous. Or as Genesis says, Abraham was reckoned righteous. We are understood as righteous because we are considered righteous by God because of Christ. And therefore, this is what is called the forensic doctrine of justification. God declares me righteous. God declares me saved because of the cross, not because he's judging my life according to all of what I do at the end, but because I have faith in that death, I am covered by that victory. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And that promise that there is no condemnation is one of the most uh, powerful sheet anchors of the Christian hope. This is the way we should understand the last judgment, not in legalistic categories, but in terms of love. I was taking part in a big service in Sunderland, a city in my diocese, last night, and we sang at the end of that service that lovely hymn by Wesley, which finishes up, No condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him is mine alive in him my living head and clothed with righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Now, when the well-taught Christian looks ahead to God putting the world to rights, the well-taught Christian will say, on the one hand, I am a sinner, I know myself to be a sinner, and so I deserve God's judgment, but because of Jesus and what he's done, there will be no condemnation, there will be judgment, the world will be put to rights and I will be put to rights, but that will be a healing, life-giving thing because it is the Jesus who knows me and loves me who is the judge and through whose death and resurrection I know that I can stand confident before God. Draw.